Hello, I'm Susan Hosback, Executive Director of the Mini Pearl Cancer Foundation. We believe raising the clinical trial question is critical for every newly diagnosed survivor. Clinical trials should be available to everyone, and everyone deserves guidance. You deserve to understand why clinical trials are important and should be considered. There are misconceptions, so I've invited Dr. Howard Burris, who is Chief Medical Officer of the Sarah Cannon Research Institute, to join me to answer some of those concerns. Dr. Burris, welcome. Thank you, Susan. So let's start first with, can you define a clinical trial? A clinical trial is a research study to understand how well a new treatment strategy works. It's really the basic building block for most medical advances. Hmm. So who conducts them? Clinical trials are conducted by physicians, physicians in the specialty in which the disease being studied is appropriate for them. So oncologists conduct cancer studies mm -hmm. and they have a research staff with them that usually comprises of research nurses, clinical nurses, and data managers. Are they safe? Clinical trials are actually very safe. The oversight of clinical trials in this country and really around the world has reached a new level of uh, concern of looking at the the conduct of the trial, looking at the consent process. We have both local authorities and federal authorities involved in the oversight. Patients are very carefully consented for these. There's a number of safeguards. That's some of the steps that take place in the trials to make sure that you're an appropriate candidate and that you've got the organ function, that your kidneys and your liver and your lungs and heart are mm -hmm. safe to participate. So really from looking at the patient, looking at the information, both gathered and to be developed, it's really quite an a interesting process. Well, and that leads me to the question, why is this the best management of any cancer patient? So it really takes a, a little bit of the guess out of uh, managing a cancer patient when you look at participating in a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. Forces the physician and the patient to really sit down and go through what are the options. Makes you really think about what is the best standard of care and then also, what's the best new therapy that might be out there? It also starts you at the beginning. Process A to look mm -hmm. at all the characteristics of a patient that determines whether it's safe for them to participate. and really makes you think about the kind of patient that's in front of you, their eligibility and their suitability. And then lastly, for a clinical trial, the extra support that's given. We all like to think that whether you're on a study or not, you know, you're really getting good care. But the additional research nurse, the oversight of your data by extra people, the other steps you have to go through really creates sort of an experience plus for the patient. They're getting a little bit better, whether we, we like to say that or not, than the patient who's not on a clinical trial. Mm. So um, what's the comparison for participation in a cancer trial compared to other diseases? So it's interesting that participation in cancer clinical trials usually averages around 3% of all the patients that are diagnosed. To hear numbers as high as 5%, mm -hmm. and that certainly would be the top number. For children, uh, for example, with cancer, that number is probably 60 to 80%. Mm -hmm. In other diseases, such as cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, other medical problems, the participation rate's much higher, you know, in the range of 20 to 30% of patients when they're appropriate candidates. It could be that it's a life-threatening disease and there's such a hurry up to get treated that mm. patients don't want to stop and think about a study. There's also the concern that um, with the, being faced with the mortality, faced with a potential life-threatening mm -hmm. disease, mm -hmm. that patients actually get nervous about trying something new. And actually, that's why at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute, we like to say that participation in a clinical trial is the first step in fighting cancer, not the last. It really should be something that you carefully discuss with your doctors. So how can we help patients understand that it doesn't need to be as hurried up, that it, they can take the time to get the second opinions? It, and I think that's a, a great point to bring up with a patient, to think about the fact that it's better to take a few days and, and make the right decision mm -hmm. than to do something that day. Uh, it's interesting, uh, the process of cancer takes months, if not years, to develop in, in most individuals. Mm -hmm. And yet, at the time that diagnosis occurs, uh, everybody wants it cut out or treated or radiated that minute. 
And I think it really is important for physicians and nurses to take the time with their patients to say, let's look at all the aspects of your particular cancer and see what's the best therapy for you. That's going to become more important over the next few years as we move further into the direction of personalized medicine. Cancer becoming 200 different diseases mm -hmm. as we determine that there are very specific mutations that patients have. So no two breast cancer patients already look alike, mm -hmm. but it turns out that within those individual diseases, there's gonna be very specific therapies for each patient. Right drug for the right patient at the right time. Mm -hmm. Could you provide a couple of examples of some key trials that are now today's standard of care? It's interesting that, that you mentioned that. I was fortunate during my fellowship to be around when we started hearing about a mutation called CRB2 that became known as HER2. Mm -hmm. And we were searching for this, and, and back then it was frustrating because 15% of breast cancer patients had that mutation, mm -hmm. and there weren't good tests to find out who that 15% were. And doctors like to be lumpers versus splitters. Let's try to treat everybody the same and, mm -hmm. and not segment off the groups. And during the process of identifying who those patients were, mm -hmm. we were able to develop a new therapy known as Herceptin, which now has moved from salvaging patients with metastatic or incurable disease to actually curing about 85% of those patients mm -hmm. when it's given right after surgery. It's actually a fairly safe therapy, and it's been interesting to see that group of women who probably had one of the worst prognoses mm -hmm. of any breast cancer patient now be the group that actually does better than most. Mm, amazing. What should I ask my doctor? Can you give me some examples of things? I think it's important when speaking to your oncologist or speaking to who, who's ever made the diagnosis of your cancer, be it a surgeon, gastroenterologist, pulmonologist, to really ask about the options. I always encourage patients to get a second opinion. I think it's always best to ask about what's out there and what's available. Uh, what's current in oncology is whatever's happening that day, that week. I mean, it has changed so much in the last two or three years, the number of new therapies and the number of new approaches that have taken place. So it's really important, really hard to keep up to date. And I think that if your clinician, if your physician is not participating in clinical trials or not referring you to someone who participates in trials, you really have to take a second and, and think about whether that doctor's really up to date. Mm -hmm. Really hard to manage and that you can keep up with the cutting edge therapies unless you're actually involved in the process of developing them. So you definitely say get a second opinion. Definitely get a second opinion. Um, and you know that that can be done a number of ways. That can be done by phone and can be done by internet. If it's convenient, certainly traveling to see another physician is a great, great idea. Everybody has different socioeconomic means, but I think in today's information uh, society mm -hmm. that very easy to be aware. And, and be careful reading it on your own. I mean, mm -hmm. let a professional help you interpret it. I'm certainly not advocating to, to Google cancer and make your own dis treatment decision, uh, but I do think it's easy to get on the internet and find where to go, where to ask questions, and, and find out what's going on. I was involved in a case just this last week where we were able to have three or four major cancer centers provide some insight, and they unanimously agreed on sending this patient to one place mm -hmm. for that second opinion. And mm -hmm. I think that most oncologists are that way, uh, willing to share the information and making sure that patient gets to the right place. Do you have to leave home to participate in a trial? N not for most patients. I think that that's something that we at Sarah Cannon and hopefully in conjunction with Minnie Pearl will continue to change for certainly the Mid-South and, and hopefully across the country. Mm -hmm. Today's therapies are safer, they are better developed, they're much more effective against a variety of cancers, and so that makes them practical to give out in almost every setting. Cancer is an outpatient business. Uh, very few patients need to get their therapy inside a hospital after their initial surgery. And if you can get your treatment close to home, you've got a better support system. Mm -hmm. You've got Definitely. your family there to take care of you. So I think certainly you want to pursue what trials are available in your community, and we're trying to do our part, Sarah Cannon and Minnie Pearl teamed up to actually get those trials out to the communities where the patients reside. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Burris. I that really appreciate you answering our questions. Please visit our website, www.minnipearl.org, to explore the information and services 
that are available to you.